Hi folks, uh, it's good to be with you and uh, love to everybody out there. Um, my name is Jason, uh, my website is jasonburnspreacher.com and uh, you can get me on Twitter and on Facebook. Facebook it's Bible teaching, Twitter is more apologetic and on my website you can see uh, loads of books and articles that you can download for free that will build you up. Um, I should be out today preaching in Manchester but um, I've made a video about that why I'm not out today. I'll be visiting um, family members who are not well today so that's what I'll be doing today but before I go out I just wanted to do a video on the kingdom. Uh, last night I went to uh, the Tommy Robinson book signing and I've been to a few events like this um, over the last year and I've been thinking a lot about the political state of the West and the political state of the UK and how to combat that and how to deal with it and, and principally my concern and my worry is the rise of Islam and I believe this is the greatest threat the West face face today really um, and I think political correctness eventually will fade away I, I, I think that it's not as powerful as the political correct brigade think they are I think they're, they're, they've had their day and they'll melt away under the juggernaut of Islam and many people can see this happening in the next 20 years and I've been wrestling and thinking about how do we deal with this and what is the answer and as I've got to know a little bit about uh, the uprising that's been going on with Tommy Robinson and the the anti-Islamic uh, movements in the UK um, it's clear to me that so much as I admire admire them and so much as I agree with a lot of what they say it it's clear to me that there is a lack of spiritual foundation to what's going on so I think in years to come um, in many years to come 20 years time you will have two big opposing factions in the UK you'll have Islam and then you'll have a very strong anti-Islamic movement in the UK in Germany within the last three years from a handful of people to now hundreds of thousands millions of people are taken to the streets against Islam and on top of that you have politicians now that have been voted in that are anti-Islamic and so there is a strong uprising, a strong movement in the West against Islam and it's rising in the UK and it's going to get bigger in the UK. Um, the movement is only just beginning in its germ form in the UK and it's going to be a massive, massive movement in the UK. Tommy Robinson's written a book and that book is a game changer because it will educate a lot of people. Um, to the dangers of Islam and uh, people will say well why why don't you just use the word Islamic extremism <coughs> why are you saying Islam because I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an academic I like to study academically and from an academic point of view and I've shown this in in various videos Islam the actual Quran teaches jihad you read the Quran from beginning to end it teaches jihad so these Muslims that imbibe the Quran and go out bombing people who we call Islamic extremists and jihadists are only following what the Quran teaches the, the Quran teaches uh, jihad 
And uh, I'm willing to debate any Islamic scholar on it. They won't debate me, uh, but I'm happy to debate any Islamic scholar on the issue. And I could prove it categorically from the Quran and from the Hadiths. Um, I have absolutely no qualms about that from a scholarly academic point of view. I can show you very easily that the Quran is a book about jihad. But how do you deal with that? How do you deal with uh, a Western democracies that have thrown away their Christian roots and have imbibed political correctness and right under the noses Islam is coming in with theocracy with a book that teaches violence with the people that don't want to demonize Islam because they're politically correct and don't want to be deemed as pe people who are preaching hate or talking about hate we're in a, an age, a recipe for disaster I want to reiterate, I don't believe in demonizing Muslim people nor do I believe in demonizing anybody nor demonizing a group I don't believe in any of those kind of things but we have to face the fact that we're in an age of revolution we're in an age where things are not going to be the same ever again and we have to face these facts so how do we deal with these things well that's where I get onto this book it's called uh, The Kingdom and the Power. It's by Peter L. Lightheart, a pastor of Reformed Heritage Presbyterian Church near Birmingham, Alabama. He got his uh, some degrees at Westminster Theological Seminary. I've been reading this book, and this book has really helped me to think through these issues, really. Uh, it, it's about the Kingdom of God. It's about the kingdom of God, and it, and it's really, really helpful. And I want to read a few snippets. Now, I don't agree with everything this guy says. He's Reformed Presbyterian, but he's, he's into federal vision, which is a, a quirky, quirky aspect of Reformed movement in America. So I don't agree with federal vision, so I'm not advocating everything this guy says. All right? So please don't think or... Jason's into federal vision theology no this book is a, an early one of his books and it is a brilliant book it's an excellent book it's really excellent but that doesn't mean to say I'm endorsing his theology or endorsing everything he says okay but it's this book is particularly helpful to think about the kingdom of God and I'd encourage you to get hold of the book um, get hold of the book it's by Presbyterian and Reform Publishing Peter J. Lightheart, Reformed Heritage Presbyterian Church. So I would get hold of the book. It's really, really good. Um, and on page 19, he, he talks about different views of the kingdom. He says, The millennial model dominates dispensationalist treat, treatments of the kingdom of God, both popular and academic. According to this model, the kingdom, though perhaps already present in some sense, will become a concrete reality only in the future after Christ's bodily return and while he reigns from a throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years that a thousand era will be marked by unparalleled peace and prosperity this model could be called more generally a futurist model because of its almost exclusive emphasis on the future of the kingdom number two the eschatological model is dominant among New Testament scholars of various types stripes uh, though there are many fine shades of differences in formulation, nearly all scholars agree that the New Testament era is one of eschatological, eschatological tension. The kingdom, normally defined abstractly as God's rule, has already come, but is not yet consummated. The future kingdom of God has brought spoken, broken into this present world with the coming of the Christ. But God's absolute sovereignty is still contested. The church thus lives between the already of the first advent and the not yet of the final advent. This model tends to portray the kingdom mainly in temporal terms as the new age inaugurated with the coming of the Messiah. In contrast to the futurist model, the eschatological model 
while not denying a future consummation, places emphasis on the present reality of God's design. Next, an increasing number of evangelical Christians, particularly those influenced by the Christian Reconstructionist movement, operate with what might be called an ethical or social activist model of the kingdom. According to this model, the kingdom is realised on earth as a people submit themselves in every area of life to the law of the exalted Christ. Building the kingdom is closely joined with constructing a Christian world civilization and taking political and cultural dominion primarily through evangelism, discipleship, but in part at least through political means. Next, in more traditional Protestant churches, what might be called a mystical model of the kingdom, God remains prevalent though largely undeveloped theologically, taking Jesus' statement that the kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17:21 as their slogan adherents of this viewpoint understand the kingdom as God's presence and rule in the hearts of his people. If the kingdom is believed to have any outward manifestation, it is in evangelism and Christian service. And then finally, among many Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox theologians and some mainline Protestants, a sacramental or liturgical model of the kingdom is predominantly predominant. According to this model, the power and blessings of the heavenly kingdom are made present by the Spirit to the Church, primarily in her worship and through her sacraments. Sacramental worship is the present form of the Kingdom, though the Kingdom's power exerts itself beyond the hour and place of, of worship. This model might be seen as a particular variation on the ecclesiastical model of the Kingdom. So he says each, each model c uh, view captures um, what the kingdom is and and then he goes into the book and he, he talks about what is the kingdom and his references America and the battles at anti-abortion battles and the political uh, struggles of the of the right and the Republicans against uh, the Democrats concerning abortion and and things like that and that's where it really the book really began began to really help me to deal with my own situation in the UK because what he was saying is that ultimately the issue is not political that people are seeing the kingdom of God as in trying to take over the domain of various political uh, power structures and he was saying that's not actually the kingdom of God and his thesis is that the kingdom of God is the church and that it's not the political that we need to be focusing on as much but we need to be focusing on the church the church needs to be the church and and that's his thesis really and he was showing that in, in American culture there's war over education war over the family uh, war over popular culture war over the environment that these are issues in American politics and um, and um, I'm just looking at uh, some verses here. So, what is the kingdom of God? And the answer, if. We, how we answer that question is how we deal with our present situation. So if we go to Luke, I'll just get my glasses, forgive me, I'm getting old. Luke twenty two twenty nine. So if you can get a Bible, just follow some text with me just for a minute, please. Luke 22. Luke uh, twenty. 229 I and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me that you may eat and drink at my table and sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel so the kingdom there is feasting it's feasting with 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 Christ it's feasting with God spiritually speaking the kingdom also can talk about the rule of God. If you go to Psalm 145, Psalm uh, 
sorry, I've got a, I've got an itchy nose. Psalm 145 Psalm 145 verse 13 It says Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations So this is about God, God's kingdom That's it, That it's an everlasting kingdom Colossians 1.15 Colossians 1.15 Who is the image of the invisible God I think it's Colossians uh, 1.13 Colossians 1.13 Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son So here is the kingdom is that we've been delivered from the power of darkness So so what, would be, what the picture we get in here is a picture that the kingdom is about spiritual things now, what is the significance of that? The significance of that is, though we are troubled with the rise of Islam, though we are troubled with the the, the factions that are, are building today, and we can see the divisions within our society, that the, that we as Christians and, and people who want to understand our times, the most significant thing that we need to be thinking about is the spiritual realities of life. That is the issue. And if we miss that, if we miss that the kingdom is about God, that the kingdom is about fellowship with God, that the kingdom is about being under the reign of God, spiritually speaking, if we miss that, that is the most significant issue of our time. And we lose our focus, we lose our strength, and we lose our ability to deal with the challenges that we face in these days. So the kingdom is also we submit to the rule of the Lord. If we turn to one Peter, uh, chapter one, one Peter chapter two verse nine. One Peter. Chapter two verse nine. Whoops, sorry about this. One Peter chapter two verse nine. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A peculiar people that you should show show forth the praises of him who hath called you unto a darkness into his marvellous light. So the kingdom here is that we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And I think this is significant. And if we miss this, we miss we miss what how to deal with our times. That the church has to be the royal priesthood. The church has to be kings and priests before God, living before God as kings and priests. What does that mean? It means that your identity is not principally your national identity. Your identity is that you're a king and priest of the living God, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him who has called you into darkness, into his marvellous light. That you are... Uh, if you've come to know Jesus Christ, you are a child of God and you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into marvelous light. That we're to bring praise to Jesus, praise to God. That the kingdom is, if we're praising God and worshipping God and following God, then we're actually taking on the forces of darkness we're taking on islam we're taking on the political uh, divisions within our society as we are a, a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into marvelous light now there was I, i've got a video i might put it up just for a laugh i might not but i've got a visual of being at tommy robinson's um Ma, uh, uh, book signing and there's a guy dancing and he's dancing holding Tommy Robinson's book and when I was watching it last night when I came home my heart sank because I thought the guy's dancing he's had a bit to drink and I thought there's no way he has any idea what he's in for he, he has no idea and 
and the British people have no idea. And, and, and Tommy Robinson people who were at the book signing, they have no idea what they're in for. Islam is a juggernaut. Islam is going to be like a juggernaut. It will wipe out everything before it. And the guy who's dancing there with the, with the book in his hand, I thought, my friend, you have no idea what, what force of darkness is coming upon you, bro, and coming upon these people. The, 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 these people, the, 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 the Islam has expanded throughout history through, through war. And they're highly trained, they're highly dedicated, they have a strong ideology, and they will sweep all before it. So no earthly power is going to be able to stand up against Islam. And what we need to, to, to do is to remember that there's a greater power than earthly powers. There's a greater power than Islam. And that is the church, which is eternal. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So as Islam advances politically, there is a greater kingdom, the kingdom of God that will last forever. And you have been chosen, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have been chosen to be part of that eternal kingdom. You see? So you can look around and you can see the advance of Islam and you can think, oh, it's terrible and we need to save our nation. But that's not the answer because earthly powers will fail. Earthly powers will crumble. Even one day Islam will crumble. But there is a greater power. It is the kingdom of God. And if you're in that kingdom, then all is well. And, and, and we need to be in that kingdom and we need to be acting and doing the king's work. Matthew 25, 34. Matthew 25, 34. For really say unto you, this generation... Is it Matthew 25, 34, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. Matthew 25, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So, there's a kingdom... There's already been prepared and that we are part of that kingdom if we believe in Jesus Christ. And when everything fades away, we're going to be in that kingdom forever. Do you see, as we look at these things, we, we're looking at things, as we look at this situation that we face today, we start to look at it from a biblical perspective. We get a different viewpoint, you see. So it says here, everywhere in the New Testament we find this emphasis, we are already tasted the powers of the age to come. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 and 6. Hebrews uh, chapter 6 verse 4 and 6. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 and 6. For it is impossible for those who were enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they fall away to renew them again and to repent of seeing that they crucified themselves unto the King, the Son of God. It's a difficult passage there. Um, but there he's saying that people have tasted the kingdom of God, that we taste the kingdom of God. We turn to 1 Corinthians ten sixteen. 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 16, it says, The cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is not the communion of the body of Christ. So there is fellowship with God in, in the communion, in the breaking of bread. There is fellowship with God there. And, and this is the kingdom. This kingdom gives us an inheritance. We just turn to Ephesians 1.14. Ephesians 1.14 says, sorry, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So the kingdom gives us an inheritance, an eternal inheritance 
forever and ever. And um, it's the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God in Matthew 4, verse 17, Mark chapter 1, verse 14, 15, Luke chapter 4, verse 42, 43. So, we're getting um, a vision of the kingdom here. Sorry. <laughs> We're getting a vision of the kingdom. So, what this is telling us at the moment now, just just starting in this study, and I'll have to do another video, I think, after this one. But what we're what we're getting in this study is the kingdom is central. The kingdom of God is central in all this. And, and, and you need to be part of the kingdom of God. And if you are part of the kingdom of God, to appreciate what is the kingdom of God. Now in the next chapter, chapter 2, it says, I saw Satan fall. And he, and he talks about, uh, in Genesis 1.28, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule. It talks about Adam and Eve fell. And then it talks about Adam and Eve became under the grip of death. And um, man lost his, his kingship. He, he became uh, disenfranchised from ruling the earth. Uh, he talks about the... The early uh, creation story uh, in Genesis, he goes, These then are the features of God's original kingdom, the world order of creation. God is the king, but he intends to share his rule over the creation with men and women. Adam and Eve were to produce a race of rulers that would use the raw materials of creation to form a replica of the heavenly temple city of God. They were to build the earthly temple city in obedience to God's covenant law and for his glory. To empower them for their task, God blessed them with life by giving them access to his garden and by letting them eat the fruit of the tree of life. Priestly worship in God's sanctuary is the beginning and goal of the life of the kingdom. And in the garden, when Adam and Eve... So he's talking here about the Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, 2 and 3, where, it took, where Adam and Eve... The creation was created and Adam and Eve was created and Adam and Eve were put in the garden and... They were given dominion to be king, priestly, priests and kings uh, and to obey God and to they were put in a garden to, to look after it but they rebelled and that is a picture of humanity that they have moved away from being kings and priests of God. They've moved away from obeying God. They've moved away from being in the kingdom of God and, and they got captured by the kingdom of darkness, Satan. And so mankind has become enslaved. So if we turn to 2 Peter uh, chapter 2 verse 19. Uh, 2 Peter two Peter chapter 2 uh, verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought into bondage. So there, what he's saying there is that men are enslaved. They're captured by Satan. But the Lord Jesus conquered Satan. Conquered his power. And um, Jesus... Uh, came to save his people so if you look at Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 to 11 let's look at Matthew 4 verse 1 to 11 because that it's a very important passage Matthew 4 verse 1 to 11 so now Jesus now comes to Turn back the tide where Adam and Eve fell. 
and to deliver us from the power of darkness and the power of sin, the power of death and the power of Satan. And we can see the cosmic battle going on in Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Okay. Are you following me now? Matthew 4, 1 to 11. And Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness of the tempted of, to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted, fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterwards a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him unto the holy city, and setteth him on that pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written, Again thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And said unto them, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So here we're seeing the battle of the kingdom. The kingdom of God has come in Christ, but now Satan is trying to stop uh, Jesus, stop the kingdom from advancing. But Jesus deals with the devil through the word of God, not by political means, but by the word of God. But what we see is a cosmic battle. And we look at things from a political end. We see the political issues. But there's a greater issue behind Islam, and it's a cosmic battle. The devil is behind Islam. The devil is behind the political structures of our time. And there is a greater battle going on, a cosmic battle. And Satan was trying. Satan is that cosmic battle, and he was trying to stop Jesus. But and Jesus was involved in this great cosmic battle against Satan. And the way Jesus dealt with ultimately the devil is by a seeming defeat the battle was won by a seeming defeat the battle was won so let, let, let's look 1 Corinthians 15 that sounds a strange comment to make so let's go to um, 1 Corinthians 15 54 1 Corinthians 15, 54. And it says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and the mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, saying, This written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is the sting? O grave, where is the victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which give us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have this victory in Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, And I baptize you, the household of Sephon, and besides I know not where I baptize any. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Have not God made the foolish wisdom of this world? For after this is the wisdom of God. The world by wisdom knew not God. 
It pleased God, here it is, pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. So, God's answer and, and the kingdom is Christ, the Son of God, died for us. And in that apparent defeat where he died on our behalf is actually the victory against Satan and, and the kingdom of darkness because when Christ died on that cross he took the punishment that we deserved. But when he died and rose again he brought in the new kingdom in, in its greater power and glory and defeated sin, defeated death and uh, defeated Satan and it was through the cross through the death of the Messiah through the death of Jesus and that is the apex of the kingdom and that is completely different from the political power structures of today it's, it's that is a completely different way of thinking than the Tommy Robinson stuff that we see today it's a completely different way of thinking than Islam Islam wants to dominate politically, militarily. Uh, Tommy Robinson's group want to take on politically the rise of Islam. But here, Christ took on the pol politics of his day and took on the enemies of his day by realizing it was, a, it was not a political battle that he was ultimately facing, that it was a spiritual cosmic battle and that the forces of darkness had to be defeated and they were defeated not by military action, but they were defeated by a defeat, by him dying on a cross. The weakness of the cross was actually the power of God. The weakness of the cross was actually the power of the kingdom. So, and, and so in this kingdom, Christ has a throne the next chapter the Old Testament talks about the sun will come and he will have a throne again, one writer says again the New Testament gives an unequivocal answer Peter taught in his Pentecost sermon that this prophetic psalm was filled in the extension of Jesus of he into heaven writes this Jesus God raised up again this is Acts chapter 2 verse 32 36 this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he was poured forth this which you will see, see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom thou hast crucified. So when Christ died and rose again and they ascended into heaven, he is Lord and Christ, he is the King. And as a King he is to be worshipped, as a King he gives us a mandate in uh, Matthew 28, go into all the world and uh, preach the gospel. As a King he sets up his people, the church, where there are the sacraments, for example the preaching of the word, worship and the Lord's, the breaking of bread. Uh, there is an ethical standard uh, which is uh, in the kingdom we are to walk like this uh, in, the, in, the, in, in God's kingdom if we're part of God's kingdom and you are if you believe in Jesus we are to walk Corinthians chapter 12 <coughs> chapter 13 do I speak in the tongues of men sorry I just got an itchy nose do I speak in the tongues of men <coughs> and of angels and have not charity I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains <coughs> and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself un unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that is perfect, come, then what? Then that which is part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. And now abide in faith, hope, and char charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. So the kingdom there is, we're to walk in, in as we're part of the kingdom, we're to walk in, in this uh, kingdom, the kingdom of God, with love. Uh, and, and to have this, this love. And uh, in uh, Philippians chapter 2, were to have humility. It talks about, you know, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and humbled himself, even to that as a servant. And and so that was Christ that he humbled himself. And we are to exhibit in the kingdom love and, and humility and obedience to the word of God. Uh, and these things are part of the kingdom. And so what I'm offering you today is a different perspective from Islam and a different perspective from Toby Robinson's um, program really I mean um, I, 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 I agree with some of the things that Tommy says um, I agree with the need of politically uh, making people aware of the dangers of Islam I agree with those things but what I'm saying is they're not the answer the answer is that we come under an understanding of a biblical understanding of the kingdom of God and when we understand the riches that we have in Christ and all the heavenly resources that we have in Christ that is how we're to deal with this situation we're to walk in the heavenly blessings that Christ has given us let, let, let's look at that and see how much time we've got see how much time we've got yeah we've still got a bit of time so we need to walk in the heavenly blessings that Christ has given. And you say, well, what value is that if Islam rises? And, it, uh, uh, and you know, surely Tommy Robinson's group are doing a, a better thing than you just waffling on about some kind of spiritual blessings. Well, let, let's just go and look at it here. Let's just look. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ... By the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Notice there, Paul an apostle. Paul is an apostle. Paul is someone we should be listening to today. You know, you might respect Tommy Robinson. You might respect um, some of the guys down there. But what about Paul? Respecting the apostle Paul. He is from God. He's been given authority to teach us about God. We need to listen to the apostle Paul and what he has to say to us at this time. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are in Ephesus. The saints, plural. Often when you see the word saints, it's not singular but plural. It does use singular sometimes. But it says saints, plural. That God has a people. And saints are those who believe in Jesus Christ. And, and, and we need to belong to the saints. You say, well, I'm not a saint, Jay. I, 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 I don't live the way I should live. No, but a saint isn't some goody two-shoes. A saint is someone who believes in Jesus. Then it says, to the saints which are in Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. The Greek there for faithful has the idea of loyal. That the greatest need today in these times is the church needs to be loyal to Christ. 
the greatest thing that you can do in your age today to combat the rise of Islam and to combat all the division that's coming in our society is to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Verse 2, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace. Grace is undeserved mercy. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you did, not you did not deserve the mercy, but God has showered upon you his grace. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot get peace in this world politically. The real peace is knowing that we're at peace with God through Jesus. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Bless. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be a people of worship, a people of prayers. If we're not, if, if, if people are worshipping Islam, then they're worshipping the wrong thing. If people are worshipping politics, or even worshipping Tommy Robinson, you're worshipping the wrong thing. They've become an idol. We're to worship the living God. We're to worship the Father. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's not given us some blessings, but Christ has given us all blessings of heaven. Imagine you was a, a prince and you were put in a you were put in a village and the king put you in a village and you lived in the village ever since you were a boy. And and every week you were given a gold coin. And and then when you get to eighteen, the king invites you to the palace. He, he you're his son and he invites you to the palace you go to the palace and you see in every room billions of gold coins and the king says this is all your inheritance you have every blessing well you have every spiritual blessing here today in the in this world not not just physical blessings or earth or or blessings of health or blessings of money but I'm on about spiritual blessings I'm on about the blessings of the heavenly kingdom that Christ has given you all these blessings. Imagine going on, traveling through the galaxies for billions of years and seeing all the blessings, spiritual blessings that God has for billions of years, all those blessings that are yours right now in Christ. Now this dwarfs Islam, it dwarfs the Tommy Robinson movement, that we have all blessings in Christ. Verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So, if Christ has touched your life, he's chosen you. Okay? And then it says, to be holy and without blame in love. Our key, our task is to walk a holy life. That is the challenge that we face today. And it's a hard challenge. It's not an easy challenge in this world of sin. But the challenge is that we walk a holy life, that we avoid things that trip us up. You know, we avoid things that pull us down. We need to walk, and then it says, in love. Before him, in love. We've got to be people of love. We need to pray that God will give us love in our hearts. Verse 5. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, that he's adopted us, that... The, the moment you believe in Jesus, you've been adopted into the family. You're adopted into the kingdom. To the prayers of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved. We're to praise God. We're to give him worship. And we've been accepted in the beloved. Verse 7. I love this one. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That we have redemption. That Christ has redeemed us through his blood. What does that mean? Well, imagine... Uh, well, this is a true story, actually. There's a ship going down uh, in uh, Ireland in uh, 1915. The ship's going down. And the captain, uh, the officer, one of the officers was telling people to put their life jackets on the right way and they wouldn't listen. He said, put it on the right way, they wouldn't listen. They said, no, you're trying to steal our life jackets. They wouldn't listen. So they were twisting it on and putting it on the wrong way. Anyhow, a few hours later, there were hundreds of people dead in the water. And they were all upside down because they put their life jackets on wrong. 
Jesus is the life jacket. Jesus is the one that's died for you, took the punishment for you, gave his life for you. He is the life jacket. And if you put him on wrong, then you're going to perish. And a lot of people are seeking uh, salvation in Islam, but that's the wrong life jacket. A lot of people are seeing the only hope and future is the Tommy Robinson movement, but that's the wrong life jacket. The true life jacket, really, ultimately, is Jesus Christ. We need to put him on. We need to believe in him and trust in him because only he can save us. Only he can deliver us from the kingdom of darkness. We're in verse, verse 8. Wherein as he abounded towards us in wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. There is a greater thing going on right now. Christ is saving souls around the world, around the UK. And as he's saving them, they're part of this grand symphony of people that are going to be with him in eternity forever, praising him. That is the great mission of our lives today. Not to be sidetracked, by too much politics or to be sidetracked by personalities or to be sidetracked sidetracked by false religions we need to realize that if we are in christ that god is saving people and he's bringing them together and one day they're going to be with him in heaven praising him forever and that is what it's all about folks verse 12 that we should be the prayers of his glory who first trusted in Christ. We need to trust Christ, have faith in Christ, and it's about praising Him. Verse 13, In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that you believed, and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The gospel of your salvation. Again, you've got to understand the gospel. The gospel of your salvation. The gospel that Jesus Christ died on a cross and took the punishment for your sin. Let's go to the gospel. Isaiah, have a meditation on Isaiah 53. Meditate on Isaiah 53 for, the, for, for a few days. You try to scratch your head and think, Jay, I don't, I don't get what you're going on about, bro. Well, meditate on Isaiah 53. It says, verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ died in your place to redeem you, my friend. That is the kingdom. And then he says, who believed who were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The moment you believe in Jesus, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, comes in your life and testifies that you are a child of God. Yeah? It's like, it's like you, you inherit... Uh, it's like your dad's a millionaire, yeah? And your dad gives you says you know son i love you daughter i love you it is here, 50 grand you've got a down payment and then one day your dad gives you the full whack he gives you all the millions that he owns but before for a few years you were given 50 grand when he says you're sealed with the holy spirit it means you've been given a uh, part of your inheritance but you're going to get the full inheritance the full presence of god in eternity one day 15. Where I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We need spiritual knowledge. We need spiritual wisdom. We need spiritual eyes in these days. You know, uh, the thing about the Tommy Robinson movement and is it's not spiritual. There's no spiritual depth there there needs to be a spiritual depth you know tommy you need to be reading your bible bro you need to be getting into the gospel and and many of the tommy robinson movement 
You need to be in your Bible. You need to be reading your Bible, learning about the Bible, studying about the Bible, knowing your Bible, knowing the gospel, because there is no way in a million years you're going to be able to take on the forces of Islam unless you're in this book, period. You're not going to do it. doesn't matter. E e even if you have an army, you're never going to win. You need the power of the kingdom. You need the power of Christ in your life. You need the power of the Holy Spirit and you need to deal with it as a spiritual man and a spiritual woman. And that is to walk in the kingdom. And what is, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. There's mighty power in weakness. Christ was weak. Christ died on a cross. That is weakness. But then he rose again and the power of God was with him. And the power of the Holy Spirit came down. And, and, and in that weakness was power. When we are weak, we are strong. And the power of God is in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to those who believe in Christ. At the beginning of the, Roman, at the, beginning of the early church in the book of Acts, the, the early church faced the Jewish people, which were like the Muslims of the time, a, a, a very strong Jewish sect, and they faced the Roman Empire. And within 300 years, the Christian faith beat every enemy, beat the Jewish people, beat the, um, the, the Jewish Pharisees and people like that, and beat the Roman Empire. Why? By the power of the Holy Ghost, by the power of God, by the power of the kingdom, by the power of prayer, by the power of the word of God, by the power of love, by the power of the Holy Spirit, my friend. That is what we need today. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of God. We need the power of His grace. We need to know that we are saved. We need to know that we're born again. And we need to walk in the kingdom's power. We need to walk as kings and priests worshipping our Lord. We need to walk as kings and priests loving our neighbour, loving our fellow brothers and sisters. We need to walk as kings and priests and allow this word, the Bible, to come into the situation, to come into our nation, to come into our schools and colleges and universities and allow the word of God to come in. Far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named and uh, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. The only name that we need to know is Jesus Christ. The only name we need to be worshipping is Jesus Christ. We worship him, we praise him, we give him the glory, we give him the honour. You know, uh, so many people were praising Tommy Robinson, adulating Tommy Robinson. I'm not against that. But they were honouring him and, 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 and adulating him. But there's a danger that it could become idolatry. Where we don't worship Christ. Where we're worshipping personalities. And we're following personalities. People bow before a storm.